Modern scientists, of course, have a much clearer view. But they might wish they didn't, because thanks to the quantity over quality nature of sperm production, a long, hard look at an average ejaculate today gives us the first clues as to why men need so many sperm. Of the many millions of sperm that are ejaculated, we've got a huge range of different types. If we were to look at them down the microscope, you would see some sperm that were really just hardly moving at all, were just twitching, or some sperm that would appear dead and may well indeed be dead. If you looked at their shape, you would see sperm with large heads, you would see sperm with small heads, you may see sperm with two heads. In an average fertile man, that only 18, 19, 20% maximum of his sperm will have a nice size and shape. The rest, the other 80%, really aren't going to get anywhere at all. To succeed in the race, sperm must be as fresh and numerous as possible. Any old ones won't make it past the starting blocks. And as they decay, they will release substances that can actually harm younger sperm. What is inappropriate is the fact that the man uh, may be denied by his wife from ejaculating for three weeks prior to the fertile window in this um, bizarre thought that they're, they're going to be super sperm and huge numbers of them. That would be the wrong thing to do. So is the right thing to do to ejaculate as often as possible? Apparently not. If a man is ejaculating too frequently, then the sperm production process and the sperm stores simply won't contain enough sperm. So just how regularly should a couple have sex to make sure his sperm are match fit? If a couple is having intercourse every two about the month, then they will hit the fertile window at some point and their, their, chat, their probability of conception is probably as good as it could be. Now, ready or not, Glenn's sperm begin their quest for conception in the vagina. Their objective to find the entrance to the cervix high above them at the vagina's farthest reaches. From the perspective of a sperm, the vagina is like a vast mountain range. It's an enormous and awe-inspiring place. Five miles deep and two miles wide, flanked with vast vaginal walls up to one mile high. Leaving the thick semen armor that protected them for landing, it's time for Glenn's sperm to make a break for the cervix. great advance has begun. But it's not just the epic terrain in the vagina, or even their own physical failings that now pose a mortal threat to sperm. Everything in the vagina is working against sperm survival. There's only a matter of minutes between sperm's arrival and potential death. Sperm face attack from every angle. The use of intimate lubricants and even saliva here can render a sperm lifeless in minutes. Worst of all, thanks to the female immune system, the vagina is coated with deadly acid. 
the acids are there to kill any invading force. And I think that's a really important point to recognise, because as far as the female is concerned, sperm are an invading force. They're foreign cells. They could be there to cause damage. They could be there to spread infections. They are foreign cells to her. And as far as her immune system is concerned, they need to be destroyed. Within 30 minutes of entering a vagina, over 99% of sperm will be dead or dying. For our sperm people, it would be a scene of devastation. survivors press on into the dark side of the vagina. Desperate to somehow escape death by reaching the cervix high above them. But the entrance is out of reach. Now, to avoid total annihilation, Emily's body needs to come to the rescue. Emily is approaching ovulation, a process that causes estrogen to surge through her body, softening the hard mucus that usually seals her cervix for the rest of the month from anything nasty. This cervical mucus will drip into the vagina, offering Glenn's fittest sperm a lifeline into the next stage of the race. Back in our sperm people-sized world, what would this lifeline compare to? Well, what if your life depended on climbing a ladder? A ladder stretching over a mile into the sky. It's a long, gravity-defying climb that only a tiny fraction of sperm will be able to manage. For the 60,000 or so that do, it's out of the frying pan and into the fire. Now, they must endure stage two of their quest, the cervix. The objective here, to push four centimeters to the other side and reach the wide open space of the uterus. sounds simple until we take a closer look at the terrain the cervix is quite simply sperm hell it's lined with tens of thousands of tiny branching tunnels most roads to nowhere and some just a single sperm head wide where the vast majority if not all of Glenn's sperm will get crushed trapped and ultimately face a slow death nature does have a selection process in the cervix it is selecting sperm that are well made it would be a bit like me, dressed as a sperm, trying to climb a staircase that's a kilometre high. I'm defying gravity, I'm going against the flow, and when I get to the top I find that I've gone down the wrong staircase and I should have gone down another one. Our sperm must fight their way, crushed amongst thousands of others, up through a twisted, nightmarish urban environment.
Only 1% of sperm that make it into the cervix have any chance of making it out alive. But could the performance of Glenn's sperm be affected by his performance between the sheets? This woman thinks so. As Dr. Joanna Ellington knows, an average fertile healthy couple has just a one in five chance of conceiving every month. And for her, success depends on the quality of the sex they're having. The better the sex, the better your chance of conception. One of the things that a lot of men don't realize is that the more excited they are, the further back in the testicle they're gonna draw on reserves. So if you have what I like to call gourmet sex, where you really spend time and you really make it fun for both partners, that is gonna make the man more excited, more stimulated, and he's gonna ejaculate more sperm and their healthier sperm. Nice theories. But today's cutting-edge research suggests female orgasm could play an even more vital and proactive role in aiding the sperm's journey. 19th century evolutionary psychologists believed the purpose of female orgasm was to keep a woman lying down longer after sex, keeping sperm in the body and increasing her probability of conception. More recently, it's been suggested the female orgasm evolved to create a stronger bond between lovers, increasing the chances of the couple staying together after a child is born. Nice theories. But there's never been any actual evidence to support the idea that female orgasm had any functional relevance whatsoever. Until now. I happen to be a fan of female orgasm myself, and that's from a physiologic standpoint as well as a personal one. What happens during female orgasm is the pH in the vagina actually is elevated some. There's some changes in the ion concentration, and there are contractions that help pull the sperm up into the female's body. Some people mistakenly think that female orgasm is bad for conception, and there's certainly no evidence of that. In fact, the evidence would suggest that it's a good thing to have. Luckily for Glenn, 3,000 of his sperm are both fully fit and managed to avoid getting lost. But as the female immune system prepares to mobilize its elite assassins, the great sperm race is about to get even tougher. Inside an unsuspecting woman, the great sperm race is underway. Our army of sperm, unstoppable by sheer force of numbers, have fought their way through the mountainous terrain of the vagina and squeezed through the tight passageways of the cervix. Getting this far has cost many lives. Now, just 3,000 sperm remain. Entering the uterus would be quite a sight.